Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Wealth and Wisdom. Today we are discussing the modern day slave trade. Debt is the cornerstone of our societies today. Borrowing money and repaying it has become a norm, common almost to the point of ubiquity. According to the Bank of England 97% of money in circulation is attached to some kind of debt. Despite the fact of being banned in international law and most domestic jurisdictions, modern forms of debt bondage live on. According to a UN report, it remains the most prevalent forms of modern slavery in all regions of the world. Yet this phenomenon is still not universally understood nor recognized. Indeed, there is no doubt that the bondage associated with debt is rampant at an individual and international level, and perhaps at the levels not seen before. On the surface, slavery may be a thing of the past, but in essence the effects of are even more pervasive in the current world. The only difference is that the modes of exploitation in the modern day slavery are more sophisticated and better disguised. Rich countries have the resources to lend to the poor countries leading to a manipulative creditor-debtor relationship. Concerning this, Hazrat Mirza Masrur Ahmad who is the caliph, spiritual leader, to a large number of Muslims known as the Ahmadiyya Muslims, he once said. In today's world, physical slavery no longer exists, but it has been replaced by economic bondage and servitude, wherein the relationship between the most powerful nations on earth and weaker countries has become akin to the relationship of a master and a slave. For example, loans disguised as aid packages are given by rich countries to weaker nations who have no option but to accept whatever strings are attached. Invariably, the crippling levels of interest mean that the short-term loans lead to long-term misery and liability. The end result is that the defaulting country has no choice but to bend to the will of the dominant nation. Such slavery is utterly immoral. Under traditional slavery, freedom was only possible through repayment of the underlying debt it would not be known when the debtor would be able to discharge the obligation. This meant that not only were many slaves were born slaves, they died as such and passed slavery down through generations. In servicing the debt, interest payments lead to a vicious cycle of poverty. Islam vehemently forbids the charging of interest and admonishes those who wage war against Allah, in the strictest possible terms. In our current system of credit-based capitalism, there is more than meets the eye than just rational and material exchanges within a market economy. It entails the social, moral, and effective estrangement of its subjects. Debt is a type of moral contract where the person who is contracting the loan is promising that they will pay back the amount plus interest. But the lack of understanding and scrutinizing of the way the financial system works and how money is created has reinforced a fundamental trend which places a growing number of people and countries under the supervision of banking and financial institutions. This behoves us to think about social as well as international relations in a way that breaks with a paradigm dominating both economic analysis and some theoretical traditions, that of material, routine or symbolic exchange. The free trade philosophy which presupposes a relative equality of the parties involved should have been opposed to a radically asymmetric perspective where the founding of social and international relationship is in fact a relationship of domination. In reality, the opposite occurs in practice where a singular form of entity is constituted the indebted man, nation, and the relationship between the creditor and his debtor becoming the true archetype of social and international organization. We must not deduce from this statement the disappearance or non-existence of exchange, but only that it functions from a logic which is not that of equality, but of imbalance and of the power differential. The debtor is free, as long as his actions and his room for maneuver take place within the frameworks defined by the debt he has contracted. This is true for the individual as well as for a population or a country. In our own society anyone can have access to a mortgage or loan. With this concept it appears to one that he or she is equal to everyone else because they have the same access to that facility. However, in reality this is not the case. When one borrows money for some reason, interest causes him to be drawn deeper into quicksand and, as a consequence, the later generations are often burdened by debt. It is no longer the original sin that is passed on to us at birth, but the debt of previous generations. The indebted man or country is subject to a credit-debtor power relationship that accompanies him throughout life, from the cradle to the grave. There is a plethora of examples in history about the extreme lethality of financial hubris. The European powers used debt as a means of accumulating wealth and as a powerful weapon for ensuring domination, leading to the total submission of previously independent states. From Latin America to China, Greece, Tunisia, Egypt, or the Ottoman Empire, they all went down that road to hell. During the first half of the 19th century for instance, although still under Ottoman rule, Egypt initiated a major project of industrialization and modernization. 
the country carried this venture without recourse to external debt and by mobilizing internal resources. But in 1839-1840, a joint military intervention by Britain and France, followed a little later by a second attack by Britain and Austria, compelled the Pasha and Viceroy of Egypt Muhammad Ali to give up control of Syria and Palestine, regarded as home turf by these powers. The second half of the century witnessed a radical turn, and Muhammad Ali's successes caved into British pressure, adopted free trade, dismantling state monopolies and relying on external debt. This was the beginning of the end. The era of Egyptian debt was set in motion. The country would soon concede its infrastructure to the Western powers, European bankers and unscrupulous entrepreneurs. Unable to pay off the colossal debt, the military occupation of Egypt began in 1882 and the country was transformed into a protectorate. Throughout history, domination via external debt was a significant part of the policies of the major capitalist powers. Indeed, the most corrosive method of gaining personal wealth, from the ancient world to today, is interest-bearing debt that mounts up with compound interest. The inability to pay has led number of populations to lose their property and ultimately their liberty as they become bond servants to pay their debts. If you learned something today don't forget to like and subscribe. Until next time, assalamu alaikum.